Is an ineffective discipleship model a concern for you and your church? Well, today we're going to be talking through how to build up a discipleship model that gets the results you're after on the Church Revitalization Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Church Revitalization Podcast, brought to you by the Malfers Group team, where each week we tackle important, actionable topics to help churches thrive. And now, here's your hosts, Scott Ball and AJ Matthew. Welcome to the Church Revitalization Podcast. My name is Scott Ball, and I am joined by my good friend, AJ Matthew. We are glad to have you today on the Church Revitalization Podcast. We are brought to you by Faith Street. Faith Street is an iOS and Android app that brings congregations together. It strengthens people's commitment to the church and to each other, and it builds community by prompting prayer and mindfulness, generosity, reflection, fellowship, and teaching as daily practices, helping you to make discipleship a habit in your church and not just an event. If you're interested in learning more about Faith Street, please go to faithstreet.com forward slash Malfers. Church Revitalization Podcast listeners can get 20% off. That's Faith Street, F-A-I-T-H-S-T-R-E-E-T dot com forward slash Malfers, M-A-L-P-H-U-R-S. AJ, Faith Street helps uh, churches to think about discipleship as a habit rather than just an event. And Mm -hmm. that's what we want to talk about today too. This idea of uh, having discipleship processes in your church that actually get results. And so I'm excited about this topic today, AJ. I think we're going to drill down into maybe some of the reasons why, um, why churches struggle with discipleship, effective discipleship so much. Um, You sent me, Oh, you, you reminded me of a Barna study that came out last year before the pandemic mm-hmm. that listed that among the top concerns of of pastors before the pandemic was was that uh, discipleship's not happening at the at the pace or at the way or the effectiveness level that they would like to see, and I think that's only been exacerbated mm-hmm. by the pandemic. And um, so I'm excited. We're going to kind of dive into maybe some of the reasons why this has broken down in the past and what pastors can do to change that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, ineffective discipleship is was the thing brought to the surface most by the pandemic. So years yeah. of neglect in intentional discipleship led to a falling away of the church when the doors were closed and locked. And that's really unfortunate. It was really disappointing and scary. And, um, and unfortunately, you know, I mean, some churches were super strategic during the pandemic and they're like, this is an opportunity for us to really take a a fresh look at what we were doing and make sure that we're Mm -hmm. better going forward. But the majority of churches didn't. And so as the, here in the United States, as the pandemic begins to subside, what we're going to see is human nature return and that is go back into old habits and um so i think this is key right now because churches are still beginning to think about how are we coming back what's it going to look like when we come back and i hope you watching today if you haven't already been thinking about how can we better disciple our people we're going to offer you a paradigm shift today that might be significantly different from what you have presently done or what you're presently doing or what you've done in the past because there's a lot of tradition built into discipleship in the church, Scott. Yeah, I, I think that, that um, that's a great segue maybe into the very first uh, point that we wanted to make, which is you actually have to start with defining the results that you want to see. Um, I, I believe we're going to talk about this in our next point, but you know, so many, so many times we just start with what it is that we do. Mm -hmm. rather than what it is that we're hoping to see. And this is one of the things that I love about the New Testament, AJ, is there's almost, let me rephrase that. There's not a lot in the the New Testament about how we ought to do church. There you go. But there is a lot of discussion in the New Testament about the outcomes we ought to see, the results, the ends that we're trying to achieve. Um, I was reading... Um, the strate- strategic disciple making this is one of Aubrey's books. A um, little plug for one of his older books, but you know he talks about how um, he points to John 
and how John talks about it in his gospel, and he also talks about it in his um, his later epistles, this idea of how can you know that you're actually a believer? And he talks about how you, by being dedicated to Christ's teaching, um, by committing yourself to loving other people and, and living out these one another commandments. Mm -hmm. So, it, 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 you know, there's a lot of discussion, AJ, about the ends of discipleship, not so much about the means, but we have to define it. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, talking about the things that we can encourage people to do in the church is is where I think we need to begin looking at this, because it, it's super easy to go look at the fruits of the spirit and say this, you know, here you go. This is, you know, this is what a disciple looks like. And that's absolutely mm -hmm. true. The Holy Spirit does a, a good work in everybody and, and brings these things to the surface and renews um, our lives, but we can't program the fruits of the spirit into the church. We can't have the love class and the patience class and, and, and then expect to see those results happen. We need to let the Holy spirit do what the Holy spirit does. And in the church, we can, we can develop and design things that we can encourage people to participate in. And by that participation, we, um, we hope to achieve growth. We hope to build good habits and introduce them to, to concepts and get them into the word and, and teach well so that um, we can help facilitate changed lives. And, and so by those things that we can do as a church, hopefully the end result then is a maturing disciple. And so uh, defining the results of a discipleship process in the church is where we have to start with that. Yeah. So to simplify the question, you know, um, I think Aubrey does a really good job, actually, in chapter seven of this book I was showing you. He just asked the question, how would we know a mature disciple if we saw one? When's the last time that the leaders of your church, whether if you're a solo pastor, maybe just sitting on your own or with your board, brought this up at one of your, your, your meetings, and you just sat and you looked at it and you thought, how would we know how would we know a mature disciple if we saw one? And you're right, AJ, that I think some people would immediately go to the fruits of the spirit and say, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Okay. Oh, that, that's good. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's good. But those things are really difficult to measure mm -hmm. and quantify. So what, what would be some other places that we could, could look to? And so, um, uh, Aubrey in the book points to two places. One I already mentioned, these these instructions by from John, you know, abiding in God's word and loving one another and bearing fruit. But then uh, I think a more concrete one that's easier, I think, for us to latch on to and someone that we use when we work with churches is in Acts chapter two mm -hmm. to look at what were the behaviors or uh, AJ, I think you call it the characteristic actions. Yeah. Um, so not character qualities but actions, behaviors, habits there of disciples. And so if you reframe it that way, it becomes much easier to answer that question. It's difficult to quantify someone's subjective character, but it's easy to see habits in people mm -hmm. and actions and behaviors in people. So what are those, what are those ends that we might be looking for as we look at Acts chapter two, AJ? Yeah. Acts chapter two, I think I, I just, I love this because it's the birth of the church and there there's no talk in there that the, the disciples got together and they designed a discipleship model and it included these things. These are the things that came naturally. The Holy spirit led them to do things. And again, separating what a mature disciples um, life might be like or how they are versus what they do action versus maybe character or, or, um, you know, the way they, the way they conduct themselves. And so in Acts chapter two, we see some, some awesome and key things that were true of the church then, obviously. And I think they're good for the church now. So those people were worshiping, they were in God's word. They were under the apostles teaching. They were fellowshipping with one another. We're talking like really in each other's lives. They knew the dirt. They were right. praying together. They were serving each other, and you, I'm sure you could extend that out into, you know, beyond their them, themselves or their, their, you know, if you want to call it a congregation, they were serving beyond that. 
they were sharing their faith. Um, and so, you know, the Lord added to their number daily that that was happening because of their witness um, by the Holy Spirit to the gospel of Jesus. Um, did I forget one, Scott? Did I catch them all? No. Yeah. Worship, community, yep. uh, biblical instruction. Did, I, yep. did you say that? Got it. Um, service, evangelism, yep. prayer. So these are all things that you can see happening in, mm -hmm. in, other, in other people. And they are actually things that you can develop means to achieve. And that's, that's the point you're trying to make, AJ, versus the fruit of the Spirit, where it's difficult to design means to achieve the fruits of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. We would hope that the fruits of the Spirit would maybe be, would be the fruit or the byproduct of these habits, which we can sort of help to design to, to have happen. Yeah. Is that a fair way of saying it? I think so. I think so. All right. So if you have questions. So yeah, send them in. The first, the first step here, AJ, is just defining, um, def defining the ends that you're trying to achieve. Define the results you're trying to achieve of a discipleship process. And don't just take our word for it, by the way. Like push on that. You do the work. Like we're pointing you to Acts two. We're pointing you to the Book of John. We're pointing you to different places. But you do the work with your team and go. Okay, what do we think are the the characteristics, the actions, the behaviors of a mature disciple. We think that you'll agree with us, but um, don't just take our word for it. Do the work. There you go. Number two, though. So if we if we define what our results are going to be, what what are what are the things we want to see people doing as maturing disciples? Well, then we need to des design a model in which we can facilitate that in the church. And again, the individual has responsibility. God has responsibility. Um, and the church has responsibility in the maturing process of people. And uh, we don't want to confuse what God will do with somebody with what the church can do with somebody. And so we can design um, a, a model for growth in maturity. And we can take that, that Acts 2, those characteristic actions that we saw people doing in Acts 2, and we can begin to build a model in our church then. How can we then, think about it this way, how can we as a, as a church facilitate worship? How can we facilitate prayer and fellowship and service and evangelism? What can we do as a church so that people can participate in these things together? That's the basic question that we ask in, de in developing a discipleship pathway in the church. Yeah. I think what's important to remember <clears throat> is that the ends that you're trying to achieve are static what in the sense that what makes a disciple a disciple today is true 30 years ago 300 years ago 500 years from now a disciple is still defined by a person who acts or behaves or has these habits and that's universally true doesn't matter what culture you're in what you know if you come from an ethnic background or you're speak a different language doesn't matter, right, AJ? That's right. So starting with that assumption, the thing that's dynamic or the thing that can shift is the means. The means can change. The problem, and we all know this, like I'm not saying anything that any listener is going, wow, that's revolutionary. It's not revolutionary. But there's a disconnect between what we know cognitively and then the way in which we behave. And the way that churches tend to behave is that they have they have a means in mind. They have a prescriptive means in mind. Mm -hmm. you know, um, I can specifically remember working with a church in West Virginia several years ago that there was no way. The, the pastor told me this. We are not getting out of Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, three sermons a week. He told me that. He said, we're, we're, not, we're not going to do anything different. Is and, and to, to this day, I still follow them on Facebook. They haven't. They still do those same things. Those are consistent. So, are consistent. yeah, they're very consistent. Um, there's nothing evil or wrong about three sermons a week. There's just the open question of, does it achieve the ends, AJ? Right. And so most churches start with a predetermined set of means, and then they try to shoehorn the ends into them. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't work. You have to start with the ends 
These are the things we're trying to achieve and then relentlessly evaluate the, the means. And this is where so many churches, AJ got stuck in the pandemic. Yeah. They could, they were so stuck on, I need to, to do the means that they forgot that the point is the ends. And they could have, you could have totally redesigned ministry for even for a short term season during the shutdowns it, and not have categorically changed as a church if you were always focused on the the ends to begin with mm -hmm. is that am i making any sense yeah and there may be people listening right now there that maybe this still hasn't clicked with them yet and they're thinking okay all right great the acts two stuff that sounds good how am i going to do that with my sunday morning worship service in sunday school class and then maybe a third thing in the week and we're saying no clear the slate clear the slate start over right. Um, and, and so now people are just turning it off. They're like, okay, well, I, I can't do that. Um, don't turn this off. Think about it. Pray about it. Um, you, you don't have to, I mean, where did this come from? Right. I mean, how far back do we need to go to go? Yeah. Sunday school is, is the right thing. And the way we do our worship service is the right thing. And so uh, Wednesday night prayer meeting is the right thing. Um, no, it's just tradition. It's just tradition that has developed not out of anything, as you said, Scott, not of anything evil or misguided out of only pure oh, and and not religion. anything out of scripture yeah <laughs> the bible didn't tell you to do it yeah that's true um right it it does it did not lay out how to do church so no it didn't so consider largely it didn't largely consider didn't. A, a new a new way of looking at things and uh so this is this is what we're going to repeat throughout this episode is uh is designing a process for the ends not the means and so if that means reimagining what your Sunday morning worship service looks like so that specific language can be used so that um, certain concepts can be introduced, then do that. If Sunday school is, is stale, then ha hey, take a fresh look at it. I'm not saying you even have to get rid of Sunday school. There's different ways of doing Sunday school. I spent many years in a church in which Sunday school was a super deep dive, deep theological dive every week into God's word. And, and it built me up in, in ways I would never be able to, to quantify. Um, you know, we, it, it facilitated deep discussion and, and getting to know people. Um, we weren't, you know, all sitting, facing someone and getting sermon part two, um, or, or, you know, a completely different sermon in a lot of churches, Scott, They're like, okay, I just went and heard my sermon from a pastor. And now I got my second sermon from my not pastor Sunday school teacher. So, um, yeah, think about doing church in a different way. Yeah. Um, again, this is not, this is not going to be something brand new that most guys and gals hearing this haven't heard. Um, we always talk about how, you know, God's word never changes, but the way we do things changes. Okay. But when's the last time you actually changed anything? Mm -hmm. And when's the last time you sat down and you thought, what if, Kind of just start with that prompt. What if we cared more about the ends than we did the means? And what would that look like? What would have to change? What what's not what is actually not working? These are the kinds of things we deal with in strategic envisioning, AJ. When we we don't just you know, we're not coming in there scorched earth style, just trying to to burn up all your programs and and keep nothing. But we're trying to, like a surgeon, go in and, and look specifically and ask, why isn't this particular thing working? Mm -hmm. Why is our, what is it that we're trying to, what is the end we are trying to achieve, say, with a worship service? And, uh, and what, which ends is it actually achieving and which ends is it not? You could make that same question about sort of the online worship. So we, so many times we're going, all right. We're just taking the worship service we're doing in person. We're filming it. We're putting it online. There can be a gap. You can be achieving certain ends in person that that don't translate when you put it online. And if that's the case, then for people who are still fully online, and there's a particular set of, subset of people where that's the case, certainly depends on where you are. If you're in Canada, we're sorry. I think you might still be in COVID jail. I'm not sure. Yeah. But you know, you've got to ask the question, is the thing that we're doing actually achieving the ends we're trying to achieve? Don't get so focused on the means that you forget the ends. So 
design design your primary ministries to achieve these ends. There you go. Let's keep going. Number three, though, is you got to train for results. We cannot, mm. we cannot, we can't design a model, can't define our results, design a new model, and then not prepare leaders to carry it out. And this is an often missed concept that, okay, you know, we could get together as, you know, a strategic leadership team, an elder board, you know, a church council and go, okay, we, we, we will make some changes. Um, and then just say what the changes are and expect them to get done. We've got to be able to train our people effectively. And of course, we've done episodes on leadership training, Scott, and we could go deep on this as well. But if you want to get the results, you've got to train people for the results. And, and right. this is an important thing. And of course, you know, training, having a leadership pipeline model in your church and training people effectively, not only are you going to train them for the results that their ministry needs to achieve, but just as a sidebar here, training people well also is what funnels, brings your mission from the, the highest levels of your organization down all the way to the lowest levels of your organization. It's a communication channel. And that's what a lot of training is about. And moving towards achieving results is about effectively communicating what those results are. So, um, you know, and also I'll come back to this thing that I just mentioned on the last point with, with like Sunday school, rogue Sunday school. And, and you probably don't see it as rogue in your church. But what you might have, though, are autonomous Sunday school classes and, and autonomous Sunday school leaders. And I know Bill is an awesome guy, and he's been teaching that Sunday school class for 32 years. Um, and at this point, everybody's just like, yeah, whatever Bill does. And, and people love Bill's class. Um, but you end up elevating Bill to co-pastor. I mean, he's got his little congregation. He designs what he wants to say every week. He, he's not, nobody needs to check on what that might be. And, and it's, it, what does it align with? Does it align with anything that the church is trying to achieve? Maybe not. And so this, this would be another, you know, tradition or paradigm shift into, hold on, we've got, we've got some great Sunday school classes. Maybe we've got 70, 80% of our church is even involved in Sunday school. That's awesome. Now maximize what you're doing with those people to achieve the ends that we, that we want to achieve. So, I mean, that's just, that's just one area in which training could, could have a profound difference in the results that you get in just one particular ministry area. Yeah. I, um, this is an area that I've been spending a lot of time in this year. I've had the opportunity to do leadership pipeline design work with several churches this year already. And, um, what what cracks me up, AJ, very often is people will say, well, how can we expect our leaders to, to do X, Y, or Z? And my response is always the same. You, you have to ask them. You have to talk to them. And you can't just do it from the pulpit or at a training meeting. You can't have a small group leader training meeting and say, okay, we want you to behave in this way and run your class in this way and say it's off to the races at that point. Um, we talked about this with Bo in a few, several episodes ago and um, how to uh, boost team effectiveness. I, I don't remember the exact title or the exact episode number, but he talked about how training, training doesn't work. Tra these traditional trainings where you get everyone together and tell them some stuff, it only works about 15% of the time. What really works in training your leaders is constant clear communication as you said aj and so there's a difference but here's a practical example for all of my all of our baptist listeners out there um if your church is doing the who's your one campaign um which i think is great i actually really like it um but if if you're doing the who's your one campaign and the majority of that is coming from the pastor on a sunday morning asking the question from the pulpit who's your one it's very easy to ignore that question. I can be inspired by that question. I can maybe even be motivated to some degree by that question, but then I'm going to forget it. What's much more difficult is if AJ sits across from me and he says, hey, Scott, who's your one? 
in a one-on-one type situation, I'm left with three choices. I can lie, make up a name. I can, or I can be honest and say that I, I don't have one, or I can be honest and then there is one and we can have a conversation about that. The same is true when it comes to discipleship results and discipleship outcomes as a byproduct of your ministry means, your small group ministries or whatever ministry you're talking about. If you're having a one-on-one conversation about here's what I want to see, here's the expectations I have, you can do this with staff, you can do this with volunteers. If you lay it out clearly and you have a conversation about it, you can hold people accountable to it. If you just cast it out there into the ether through broad communication, mass communication, a training event, a sermon, you should not expect people to live up to that because they won't. It takes that personal dialogue and clear communication in order to hold people accountable. And at the end of the day, your discipleship model is only as effective as your least effective volunteer and staff people. That's the truth. Scott, are you saying we need to be having one-on-ones with leaders in our church? I'm ex- I'm saying exactly that, yeah. Okay. And if you're overwhelmed by the idea of that and how could we possibly achieve that, let me recommend the leadership pipeline design process that we... <laughs> <laughs> we'll teach you how you could do it in a way that's not overwhelming. All right, so our last piece here, um, we've defined the results that we want to achieve in discipleship. We've designed a model for those results. We're training people to achieve those results. And finally, we need to measure and see if we're making progress towards those results. And measuring for results is a deeper a deeper look at um, what we're trying to achieve. Are we, are we truly achieving what we has, have set out to achieve or do we just have possibly an increase in participation? And this can get this can get tricky, Scott. It can. The bottom line here is just don't hyper focus on attendance. I mean, you can really trick yourself into thinking that everything's fine or that everything's terrible based on your attendance numbers. And I, I, COVID showed this. If if attendance alone was the metric for success, then every church failed last year, and that's not true. So therefore, there must be better ways to measure discipleship growth than mere attendance. So you want to judge your effectiveness ultimately on whether or not you see the characteristics of discipleship that we talked about in step one in your church. Now, can you find objective measurements for that subjective process? Yes and no. Uh, I mean, when it comes to the individual level, it's going to be hard, but you can measure progress or indicators that discipleship is occurring at scale. So you might not be able to, it'd be difficult on the one individual level to to measure growth um, in an objective way, not a subjective way or a, in a quantitative way versus a qualitative way. But if you look at it in the, in the, at, the, at scale, AJ, you, you can me- find particular indicators that are showing you a trend. And that's all we wanna see. I'm not hyper-focused, AJ. We talk about this in churches all the time. I'm not hyper-focused on the specific number. I want to know the trend. Are we trending in the right direction? And is this trend indicating to us that we are better or worse, speeding up or slowing down in discipleship? That's all I want to know. I I don't care about the specific number. I want to know the trend. That's what matters to me. The key is to ensure that you measure things that are most likely to indicate discipleship progress and not get distracted by sort of vanity metrics. One last thing I want to mention on this, AJ, before we wrap up. Um, It's easy to have this conversation with a church recently. We want you to define, say, one measure for each step in your discipleship pathway or process. And it's the one measure that you say is most likely to indicate progress, most likely to indicate progress towards your vision and and your disciple making. It's not the only things that you'll measure. You can choose to measure other things too. There are other types of goals that you can have. You just want to be sure that you set sort of these tent pole measures that are most likely to indicate your progress and use those as um, visual cues as to whether you're speeding up or slowing down in discipleship. Yep, there you go. 
Scott, thanks for uh, helping us talk through this today. Um, what can people do to continue to help facilitate discipleship and relationships in their church? Oh, they could uh, use some tools, perhaps, like our friends at Faith Street. <laughs> Just to uh, remind you, our, our, our episode today is brought to you by Faith Street. Faith Street is an iOS or Android app that can help to um, empower your leaders and the people in your church to live a lifestyle of discipleship. So, um, And listeners to our podcast can get 20% off their service. So check out faithstreet.com forward slash Malfers, F-A-I-T-H-S-T-R-E-E-T.com forward slash Malfers, M-A-L-P-H-U-R-S. What a great episode, AJ. Thank you for um, cultivating this topic for us. And um, can't wait to see how it's going to impact churches. Yeah, I hope it does. Uh, if you have any questions about this, you can email us anytime at leadership at malfersgroup.com and check out our website. We've got other information there on the ways that we can help you and for you to reach out to us. And we would love to make that introduction and uh, be a help to you in any way that we can. You've been listening to episode 88 of the Church Revitalization Podcast, and you can read the article, uh, the companion article to this episode at malfersgroup.com slash 88. And we'll be back with you again next week. We hope to have you with us. 